Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the House of Prayer for everyone. Let's all stand together. All right, welcome. Hear the call to worship from Psalm 9. The Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. He rules the world in righteousness and judges the peoples with equity. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name trust in you, for you, O Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Therefore, sing the praises of the Lord enthroned in Zion and proclaim among the nations what he has done. Amen. Amen. Let's confess our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, he was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In the night, through the struggle, through the trial, that made my burden light, you brought me back to life again.
you won't let go. You won't let go, so I will follow. Though I am yours now and forever, you won't let go, so I will follow. Though I am, you won't let go, so I will. Trials, you remain my burning light. You brought me back to life again. In the night, through the struggles, through the trials, you remain my burning light. You brought me back to life again.
trust you Know that I can trust you With my whole heart With my whole heart Know that I can trust you Know that I can trust you trust you with my future in my heart yes Lord God you say in Isaiah 40 for those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength so Lord we just invite you God we just ask that you would just renew us today that you would just refresh your heart today Jesus God I ask for your glory God to come God to fall upon this place in this place, God, a heart will throb and ignite. God will burn for you. God will throb and swell with joy. So, yeah, Lord, we want more of you. May you will increase and we will decrease, God, in this hour. Yes, Lord. Isaiah 25, 1. Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name. For in perfect faithfulness, you have done wonderful things, things planned long ago. So, Lord, I thank you, God, for your perfect love. God, for in perfect faithfulness, God, you have given us, God, your one and only Son. God, for in perfect faithfulness, God, that you have created us and has done wonderful things, God, in us and through us. God, for in perfect faithfulness, God, that you have given us a family, a house church family one that with us, will be there for us, God, that will encourage us, that will strengthen us, that will pray for us, 
that would care for us. So, Lord, I thank you, God, for this perfect love, for the love that has no limit, no boundary, the love that is so unconditional, so perfect. Lord, I thank you for that cross. God, may we never lose sight of it, God. What you have done on that cross, Lord. God, the, the blood that you had shed for us on that cross, God. May we would never forget that and lose sight of that, God. May it give us strength, Jesus, God. God, to love when it's hard, when it's difficult, when we have nothing, God, left in our body, that we will still do it, God, from the place of obedience. God, I pray that, God, that you give us, God, just a greater capacity in this season, God, to go above, beyond, God, to love the poor, the needy, to love our VIPs, God. And so, Lord, I thank you for that cross. Lord, I also pray, God, just for uh, greater grace, God, greater measure of grace in this season, Jesus. Grace upon grace, especially in our marriage, God. God, what is I pray that, God, that, Lord, that you would just give us that desire, God, to love, God, to serve one another, God, especially our spouse. God, even when we're at our max capacity, we would choose, God, you, God. We would choose to love you and love our spouse and our family. And so, Lord, I ask for that grace in this season, Jesus. Lord, I also pray, God, for um, Pastor Jason as well, God. God, I know that you have done wonderful things, God, in uh, New Haven, God, this past week. God, I pray that these testimonies, God, would just encourage us, God, to keep us, God, to, to, to do the things that you call us to do, God, to keep moving forward toward you, Jesus. So, Lord, I pray, God, just for that anointing to be upon him, God. I pray that his word would be coming from you, Jesus. So, Lord, would you just be his, uh, be his mouthpiece, God, in this hour. So, Lord, I thank you. We bless his time. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, welcome everyone. Good afternoon. We are here at Hope Church. All right. Um, oh, take time to say hello to one another. <laughs> say hi, look around. Hi everyone, welcome. Welcome, I know there are people uh, traveling. It's still the summertime. People are still on vacation and trying to squeeze in all that they can for the summer. So, hello, everyone. All right. Um, we don't have many announcements. Uh, we welcome everybody. And then the only announcement we have is that we have a congregational meeting today. Uh, we've announced this for the past uh, few weeks. It's happening immediately after our worship service. So if you could, right after the benediction is given, if you could remain in your seats. So kids, um, you'll be coming back to do communion with us. And once the benediction is given, if kids, you can also just remain in your seats and not rush to the back for the fellowship food. Uh, that would be great because we're going to have our congregational meeting right after the benediction, no break time, no bathroom break, no food break. It shouldn't be a long meeting at all. And so we're just gonna move right into the meeting. And after the congregational meeting, then we will have uh, fellowship food and, and um, fellowship time together. So please remember that. And oh, by the way, today's fellowship food is provided by the family, Hayen and Jeannie. So thank you for volunteering to provide for us today. Also, it's a new month. We are in August, believe it or not. And our August missions partner is Dustin and Holly Garner. They are in Kansas City. They will actually be joining us this Wednesday for a special HOP. As you know, HOP still happens virtually um, using Zoom. So they're going to Zoom in from Kansas City. We hope that many, many, many of you will join us Wednesday, 7.30 to 8.30 on Zoom. We also live stream it on Facebook on our um, closed a Facebook group as well. We'll hear an update from them, what they're up to, as well as have time to encourage them and pray for them. So that's this Wednesday. And for this month, it is um, Dustin and Holly for the month of August. And that is all. At this time, we will have um, a time of offering and giving. We do have the offering basket up here, as well as using your church center apps.
Father, we thank you for your goodness over us, Lord, that we are able to come to honor you, to worship you, to praise you, and to give unto you. So, Father, as we lift up this offering, may it be acceptable in your sight that we are cheerful givers unto the kingdom, that your work will be done. Father, we thank you for how you have blessed us and um, how you have been generous with us. Lord, we lift up to you our missions partner for this month, for Dustin and Holly Garner and the ministry that they're doing as they're raising up uh, people or heart of missions for your people, Lord. Father, we thank you also, God, that you are near to those who are hurting, Father, those who may be suffering through illnesses, through um, challenges, difficult times, Lord. Father, we know that you are drawing near to them, that they will see hope in you, God, for you alone are the hope of uh, this world, Lord. So we thank you. We give all honor and glory to you in Jesus' name. Amen. One, two. Hi, everyone. It's good to see you guys. Um, just want to Well, the leaders want to say it. <laughs> They're pleading with me right now. So, okay, we'll, we'll have some testimonies real quick before they go down. Um, I want to first say thank you to Hope Church. Thank you guys for praying for us, um, for supporting us financially. Just in every way you guys covered us, thank you from the bottom of my heart. And um, just it's your prayers and your sowing has not gone unnoticed, and it's been fruitful, um, and so we're really thankful for that. Also need to give a couple shout outs to um, the chosen leaders, every single one of you guys, thank you so much. Um, chosen knows this as well as anyone, but like literally chosen missions and chosen on Saturdays, it doesn't run without these leaders, and so they really poured out their hearts, so thank you guys, and of course the chosen missions team, you guys were engaged from beginning to end, and you guys really did a good job. Um, and then just a quick shout out as well, because I just thought this was really interesting. Uh, we had an entire family of kids with us this year. Um, Emily, who's a working adult, uh, Chloe, who's a high schooler, and Zechariah, a middle schooler. And all three of them have been like such a blessing to work with. So um, just a quick shout out to Tuktan and Hyunju. Just, I mean, as I'm a new father, I'm thinking of ways to raise our new child. And if I can take a page out of your book so that my kids become like your kids. It's just an honor. Um, Zechariah cracked me up. I'm gonna, I told him I was going to share this, so I'm going to share this. It was his first missions trip with us, and um, we were walking down the street. It was not a really friendly neighborhood, and someone came out of the house. And Zechariah was eager from beginning to end to pray for people. Like, he went for it. He went for it. He, like, prayed for people, didn't hesitate. He was really bold. And we were walking down the street. It was me, Pastor Lenny, and Zechariah. And he was, like, so eager. Like, he wanted to pray for the next person. We were on a roll. And someone comes out of the street. And he points at them and goes, look, there's someone there. And Pastor Lenny goes, yo, 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 don't point. If you point at them, you're going to freak them out. You're going to scare them. And they're going to go back inside or they'll walk away. And sure enough, the guy goes back into his house. And I don't know about you, but when I'm on street evangelism, like, when I make a mistake, there are... There's a catalog of like thousands of different things I could have done better. Zechariah doesn't do that. He looked at us and he goes, rookie mistake. <laughs> and I lost it. Like I lost it. I was dying. But like I learned a lot from that. You know, like as adults, we beat ourselves up for things that we mess up, right? But God is just like, chill about it. It's, a, it's okay. He's got it. He's bigger than us. And so Zechariah embodied that. I, it was such a joy to um, do missions with him. Shout out to you, Zechariah. Um, without further ado, I did invite uh, three people to come up and share testimonies. So um, the first one, if you could come out. Um, I was only going to pick two, but there were just so many good things that I, I had to ask them to come up. Come up, Ian. Are these new mics? No. One? Hello? Oh, okay. So I was asked to do, like, um, a testimony and, uh, like, the highlight of my week. So I got two ideas, and I did not write them down. So sorry if it sounds like I'm, I'm ad-libbing. I am. But uh, my first highlight was Pastor Lenny himself, because he's hosting this. And I didn't know, like, how much of a, like, God freak he was. He was really going for it. He's, like, doing all this ministry. He's hosting us. And then Pastor Jason was telling us, like, 
I don't know the details, but he was missing out on something really big. He was like someone connected him with a like football game. He turned like he turned down a uh, an opportunity to work with Native Americans and like preaching Jesus to them to host us. So that was a really big moment for me and like I closed who he was in this like box because he he did a sermon for Hope Church one time. He came up here and he said, "Oh, I restrict my kids like phone and game technology." And that's all I remembered about his sermon. I I did not remember anything else from him. And I put this like box around him like, "Oh, he's this restrictive guy. He's not he's no fun." And he looks intimidating just from the start, but when I got to see him and when I got to work with him, he was not that guy. Like his kids using technology, maybe a little bit too much, but they were really rowdy when his two kids were put together. It, he himself was like really outgoing. He was really out there. He was not what I was expecting him to be. So that's, and I really got to connect with him um, during that entire time, because uh, maybe I shouldn't get into that. Uh, it might take too much time, but like really personal. He was doing CrossFit for about like two decades or something. Did not find that out until like the really later half of the week. When we really started connecting, because that box, like, I resolved that that image of him in my in my mind. So I really started connecting with him, and he really taught me so much. And he has a podcast, apparently. Um, yeah, search up like Lenny Hernandez on Spotify, you'll see it. Oh, and um, yeah, I really started to get to know his ministry, what he, who he was, what he was doing, and he transformed that city of New Haven from Pistol Wave in New Haven to like one where where we can like the youth can just walk around feel safe, where we're just out there preaching. So I really got to thank him. That's a highlight of my week. And one personal testimony was, like, every morning, all the youth would and the leaders, too, would gather around in the room, and we would start praying, like, asking God, what are you going to do this day? What do you want us to do? What's going to happen? I think on Thursday, um, I saw this image. It was just, like, this flat ground. And there's a but picture of a butterfly on it. Now, that butterfly gets cut in half. So there's this big split on the earth where there's this, this butterfly image on both halves. This butterfly image eventually fades away. And it's, this earth is just like trying to heal itself. It's not moving. It's not coming together again. It's just happening. It's just there. This big crap. And in this very corner of like my bottom right of my vision, I see this person like healing this little part of the ground. Just this little part. And this whole thing gets healed from bottom to top. Everything. It's all healed. So I didn't know what to do with this. Interpretation, dead. I couldn't do it. So uh, I said this to the group, and Caroline says, oh, oh, this is loud. Oh, this is, this is a broken heart where you're healing this one part of it, and this whole, their whole rest of their life gets healed. So I'm building on this. I'm like, oh, this butterfly image, because it wasn't mentioned in Caroline's, inter Caroline's interpretation. I'm like, oh, this represents the innocence of a person, where this innocence gets lost, where you're this massive hit, hate destroys your life. And this innocence goes, is hurt and damaged, goes away. So we're healing this, this person. So that's what we got for that day, for Thursday. And in this morning, we're doing a crosswalk evangelizing out on the street, like Pastor Jason said. And we meet this person sitting on like cinder blocks or something. And this lady, we find out she lost her friend that day. Like she died that same day, that Thursday. Her friend died. So then, completely amazed, because we start praying for her. And I don't know what happens after that, because I wasn't there. There were other people I, I was praying for and people coming by. So I was over them, over with them. But I was told this story, like, oh, this prayer got fulfilled. And that's how I knew, like, God was really moving this week through everyone here, through, through the youth, through Pastor Lenny, too. That God was with us. God was giving us stuff. It was through the power of God that we were able to, like, reach so many people here. And I'm going to share a little bit more about that story later, too. Chloe, you want to come up? Okay, so mine's probably going to be a little bit shorter. But um, this mission trip was my, this mission trip to Connecticut was my first missions ever. So all of this was entirely new to me. Um, I've grown up in the church, and I've seen a lot of missions teams go out and evangelize, but I've never gone out myself to go out and talk to strangers about the gospel. And there are so many amazing stories of what happened there, like what Ian shared, but one that really touched me was when we went out to play kickball at a local park, and a little girl came up to me with an injury. 
I gave her a Band-Aid for her cut, and then I asked her if I could pray for her, to which she said yes. And after I prayed for her, which was really quick, she went off, and I didn't think much of it until our daily debrief that night when one of the leaders said that there was a little girl, and she told them that now she knew that when she got hurt, she could pray to God, and she knew she would be healed. I realized that that was the same girl that I had prayed for, and at that moment, I marveled at the amount of faith and trust that the girl had in the Lord and thought back to the verse, Matthew 18, 3 to 4, where Jesus said, tell, tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone be, who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Um, I'm not sure how many people have prayed for this girl's injuries before, like if anybody had ever prayed for her, but it was so impactful to see how a quick prayer could change her whole mentality, and it was just wonderful to see, and I could see the Lord moving in her, and um, the amount of faith and hope that she had in God really stuck with me, and it exemplifies what that verse says, and although this was only one story, I think that it shows how important this mission trip was. Because even one girl coming to the Lord is glorious in the kingdom of heaven. And even though we were just playing kickball, in the time we spent there, we were able to spread the gospel to so many children in New Haven and invite them to know Jesus. So I was in youth group all throughout my middle school and high school years. And so um, during that time, I've been on two mission trips. Um, and actually, one was this past mission as well. But this was my first mission trip as a leader, even though I felt like a student most of the time. So um, it was an interesting experience. But as a leader, I felt a lot of pressure to act different or to set a good example. But the Lord quickly showed me that, that um, serving him, what serving him really looked like. It looked like playing kickball with the kids and pushing them on the swings. It looked like sharing the simple gospel with them about Jesus Christ who came to die for their sins. It looked like walking up and down the street just simply asking people if we could pray for them. There wasn't an elaborate plan, no curriculum or sermon prepared days and days before, but it was simple obedience to be present in the moment and to see where God was working and join him in obedience in what he was doing. When we first did the crosswalk, I was definitely feeling very nervous. I hung more towards the back. I was kind of letting the other people go ahead of me. But after watching the youth pray for the first couple of people, I was really encouraged by their boldness and realized that there really is nothing to fear and that what we were doing was so simple. Saying hello, asking if they needed prayer was simple. And to my surprise, a lot of people are more open than you might think. I saw God moving in the way that he touched people um, touch, he touch, he, in the way that he was touching the people that we prayed for when they felt encouraged or comforted. In one of our morning devotions, and this was the story that Ian was sharing, um, one of the words that someone else had gotten in addition to the butterfly word was that we would come across an individual who lost someone recently. And that same day, we asked a woman standing on the side for prayer, and he had, she had said that she lost that friend that morning. It was in these simple moments where I saw God's big heart for his people and that in obedience, and that obedience in that moment looked like comforting that woman and praying for her and telling her that there was light at the end of the tunnel. In other moments, obedience looked like playing kickball for the seventh time that week with kids that we started to see come each day and seeing those kids run up to us as they started to recognize us. I saw God move in the way that these kids were so receptive to the simple gospel presentations we made and seeing their faith grow as they declared that God would heal, would heal their boo-boos or when they even accepted Jesus into their hearts for the first time. Or when the parents even stopped to see what we were doing and listen to these gospel presentations as well. I saw God moving in the way these people would stop us on the street and encourage us to keep on going, but also those who cursed at us from their cars as we carried the cross because all of it pointed to the power of the cross and, what we, and that we were making his name known. I learned that obedience, although it may feel challenging and doesn't always go the way we expect it to, is simple at the same time. He is the one who equips us and gives us his Holy Spirit to do his work, but we need to be willing and to make room for him to speak to us and move. I was challenged this trip not to just obey, but to make room for him and not to limit what he could do. Um, to my own mental box and limitations. The Lord used a simple red kickball to minister to his people in New Haven, 
and coming back home, I'm challenged to think what simple things he has placed in my life to use for his glory. Good job. Kids, you guys are welcome to go now. And the youth leaders who have to serve. Um, this trip felt very different. Last year, when I came back, I told you guys that that was the best mission trip I've ever gone to, like in my entire life. This year was better than last year. Um, and this year felt a little different because I think I left a part of my heart there as well. And so coming home was like bittersweet because I, I absolutely wanted to come home and be with my wife and baby, of course. But there was a part of me like, I, I don't know about the kids, but I like fell in love with some of those kids there. Like I really fell in love with New Haven. And so uh, my heart like actually broke for the city for the first time in a very, very long time. And um, that's what I'm gonna talk about a little bit today. So let's dive into it. Um, Matthew chapter 14, verse 22 to 33, a little context about what's going on before this. John the Baptist, who Jesus called the greatest man ever to exist, was beheaded by King Herod unjustly because John the Baptist was not going to hold back on sin that was very evident. And so he called out King Herod. He was beheaded um, for a family, I guess, what is that word? Favor. Right after that, Jesus is attempting to go be with the Father. Um, my instinct would tell me it's to be with the Father and grieve and process the loss of John the Baptist. If anyone has lost anyone in their life, of course, that's one of the first things you want to do. Be in solitude and process some of the loss. Instead of being able to do that, a multitude of people come to Jesus and the disciples, and they're hungry. And the disciples go, Jesus, send them away. And Jesus goes, give them something to eat. And the disciples go, we don't have much to give him. And so Jesus ends up multiplying food before he can even process the grief, right? He's blessing the food. And if I'm the disciples and I saw that, my faith is skyrocketing. Like, I don't know what food multiplication looks like before my very eyes. Like, I want to see it one day. Like, is there like a bread and all of a sudden it like splits into two? Like, I don't know how that works. So you take one and it just, it's a gift that keeps on giving. I don't know how it works. But regardless of how it works, everyone was fed. And then Jesus sends the disciples to go to the other side of the river. And Jesus says, I'll catch up with you later. Again, if I'm the disciples, I'm thinking he'll probably come by boat. Um, he probably has some other boat to come with. I don't really know. And this is where we are. Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up to the mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from the land. Buffeted, 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 just kidding. By the waves, because the wind, the wind was against it. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Okay, they were experienced fishermen. So if there was any hint of fear, that probably suggests that it was a pretty bad storm. Like they were experienced in the waters, which meant they knew what they were doing. And if there was every, any fear that hit them, it was because it was a big deal. And that's where Jesus decides to come. Peter says, Lord, if it is you, tell me to come to you on the water. Jesus says, come. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Let's pause there real quick. There's a couple things. Um, but the first thing is this. Peter just saw the miraculous feeding of 5,000 people, several thousand people. Full of faith, he walks out. Still filled with faith, he's walking on water. And in an instant, the faith starts to sink. And as his, as his faith sinks, so does he. What does that tell me? Faith is organic. Faith is not like stock. It's not your savings account where you constantly put a dollar in every day. And by the end of the year, if you don't have a dollar, you still have this mountain of cash that you can lean on. Faith is momentary for the present time. So yesterday's faith, which is why I think it's like amazing that God weaves this throughout the Bible, right? Because the, uh, the Israelites, when they were wandering in the desert, God said, get manna for today. Yesterday's manna is no good for today. 
It's the same way with us. Last year's encounter is not good enough for you today. The word you heard from God yesterday is not good for you today. Well, it might be, but what I'm saying is our faith and our walk with God needs to be organic. It has to be in the present time. That's how faith works. Okay? So Peter starts sinking, and immediately, verse 31, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. The reason why that's important is a number of things, but up until chapter 22, Jesus has already healed. He's already cast out, casted out demons. He's already preached. He's already taught. So he's shown himself to the disciples as many different faces of God. But according to the Gospel of Matthew, this is the first time that the disciples recognize Jesus as the Son of God or as God. They confess him as God. And this is the first time in the Gospel of Matthew, chronologically, that they worship Jesus as God. That's a big deal. That's a huge deal. Something about Jesus saving Peter, revealing himself to the disciples. He didn't save all of the other disciples, by the way. He saved Peter, but all of the disciples got the revelation, this is God, and they worshiped him for the first time in the Gospel of Matthew. That's astonishing. That's astonishing. That also tells me that if we walk out in faith, it's got nothing to do with whether or not you hit the nail on the head or if your faith gives out and then you start sinking, it doesn't matter. Because even in the act of faith, and Jesus can save you in front of your friends, even that can give the revelation that Jesus is God to your friends. And the response to that is worship. Let's go back one slide. And this is really what I um, wanted to hone in on. In verse 28, I don't know if you caught this. The person who is uh, invited to come on the water, the invitation did not come from Jesus. The invitation to walk on water was never given by God. Peter invited himself. If you guys have ever gone to a party, chances are you didn't invite yourself. I never wanted to be the guy growing up in school to invite myself to someone else's party. That's awkward, okay? What's even more awkward is if you show up to a wedding without an invitation, okay? That has happened before, believe it or not, okay? Don't be that guy. <laughs> but in this passage, in all of the awkwardness in our society where we're not supposed to invite ourselves to other people's parties, Peter does it. Peter is the one that says, whatever is going on with you, Jesus, over there, I want in. And Jesus doesn't go, dude, that's awkward, man. Like, what are you, that's socially weird, man. He doesn't say that. What does he say? Come. Peter invited himself to Jesus' party. You see, salvation in the kingdom is an invitation from God. But the invitation to go deeper into the things of God often comes from us. It often comes from us. And so this is what we experienced at our chosen missions trip. So I want to show this first picture. This was day one. What we did every day was we prayed. We asked God for words. Uh, we wrote them down. I wrote them down in a journal. I texted it out to everyone on the team. We went out, did street evangelism with the cross. Uh, that was the first day. Pastor Lenny's cross came back together. Praise God, we were able to carry that thing around. It was a really loud cross, by the way. If you guys ever want to make a cross in the future and you put a wheel on it, the plastic wheel is really noisy. Use a rubber wheel. Um, anyways, so afterwards we ate lunch and then we went to do VBS at two parks. This was the first park. This was actually a brand new location. So if you went to missions last year, you wouldn't recognize this park because they, we didn't go there. Pastor Lenny and Brittany said they tried to do it several years ago in this park. Nothing really came of it, so they haven't really been back there. But for whatever reason, um, they felt like we were supposed to go to this park. So we went to this park. First day, we had maybe like, I don't know, 10 kids at most, okay? 
eight kids maybe. Out of that group, Miss Rachel prayed or uh, gave a gospel presentation and asked if anyone wanted to receive Jesus as their savior. Four of them did. And then I asked the question, how many of you guys have heard of Jesus before? Or is this your first time hearing the gospel and receiving Jesus? Four hands went up. Never heard the gospel, never heard the name of Jesus, and accepted Jesus that day. That set the tone for me. I don't know about you guys, but um, missions started getting a little bit wear and tear on Tuesday, and I kind of felt this invitation from God. And I felt like God said the same thing to Peter. Come. You want more? Come and get more. Invite yourself to the party. And so uh, Tuesday night, we did this little exercise. I don't know if the kids, if it meant more to the kids or meant more for me. But I felt like maybe just for me. I don't know if this was for the kids too. But we, we, I had a box of God. Like God operates in this way. We've expected God in this way. We've expected X amount of kids. I mean, I felt like God said, break that box. Let's repent. So we corporately as a team, we repented for putting God in a box. Um, and expecting God to move in a certain way. Again, I don't know if you felt this, but I felt something break. So the day afterwards, um, we got new words for that day. And, like, my mind was blown. Like, God is so good. One of the words that Ray got was handy. He was like, is it handy? Is it handyman? I don't really know. So... Um, that was day three, so we go out into the streets. We're doing evangelism again. We're carrying the cross everywhere. Um, we go two more blocks because Pastor Lenny uh, says that the other team was, like, doing well. I was on the team that wasn't doing as well, so we were like, let's go two more blocks. So we go two more blocks, and we turn the corner, and we're walking back around, and we see this van. Miss Rachel wasn't on my team, but we see handyman on a van. This was the word that Rachel got. We only stopped because I think it was Zechariah. But one of the team members looked at the car and said, hey, does that car say Rachel in the front? They're like, no, that doesn't say Rachel. But it says handyman on the side. And so we're like, whoa, what's going on? And so we see this van. Right next to the van were like four uh, teenage college age students that were up to no good. Like legit, they were probably doing some sort of illegal thing there. And I thought in my weakness, they're going to get it today. Like God's coming after you. So I walked up to them and I was like, hey, you guys want prayer for anything? And they were like, uh, no. They were pretending not to understand me at all. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, bless you. And then they just walk away. And I walk away. I'm like, I blew it. I didn't do the rookie mistake. I was like, I should know better. And I'm walking away. We're carrying the cross. And out of nowhere, a guy starts honking and yelling at us from a car. But like, hey! And then Pastor Lenny just thinks it's the guy, like, giving him a thumbs up. So he goes, hey, thumbs up. And then we keep walking. And the car pulls right behind the handyman van. The guy gets out of the car. He goes, hey, and starts waving us down. And then I, like, look back, and I'm like, I think that he's trying to get our attention. So we go back to the van where a handyman was, and Pastor Lenny starts having a conversation with him. The guy's like, what are you guys doing? Why are you guys carrying a cross? Pastor Lenny starts sharing, like, what we're doing with outreach and things like that. And then the guy goes, yeah, my mom used to go to church. And Pastor Lenny goes, that's great, but what about you? He's like, I don't go to a church right now. And he goes, well, you do now. And he gave him his church card. And we prayed for him. Uh, we're praying that he does come to know the Lord. This was the second person. The next day, his car also said handyman. And so we're talking with him. I'm having a conversation. And out of nowhere, I'm like, you know what? I think Rachel had to do this. So I go, hey, that girl over there has a prayer for you. Her name is Rachel. So Rachel prays for him. Um, the guy next to him jumps in, the guy with the hat, and he goes, hey, I want prayer too. And so we pray for him, and instantly I feel like God is saying, like, there's something wrong with his back. And so I ask him the question, do you have back pain? And he goes, yeah, I had two back surgeries. So we pray for him, and instantly he's like, oh, that feels better. That feels better. And I was like, yes, that does feel better because that's God. Um, a couple more stories and pictures. This is Chloe. Is that Chloe? Oh, that's Caroline. That's Caroline felt like during VBS to play with the kids, and so she was doing coloring with the kids. She spent so much time with them. Like, I was really proud of Caroline. Um, this is another praise report from day three. One of the words that 
was it Emily? I think Emily got a word for the mothers, right? She was like, we need to pray for the moms. This, like, she just kept feeling like, let's pray for the moms. And I think Miss Rachel got the word that day, like, for tents, right? Um, and then I think Zechariah also saw, like, a pyramid thing. And we were like, oh, that might be a tent. We don't really know. And then Isaiah saw a picture of an ice cream truck. And um, so we're off. We're walking. We're praying for people. Uh, carrying the cross, that same cross that the boy's hugging. We walk into another park where there's no one there, and we recognize two of the kids because they had come to the VBS thing beforehand. So we stop, and we realize that she's, they are with his mom. And so I'm kind of nudging Emily, like, hey, you got the word for mom. Go pray for the mom. And she was like, okay. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go with you. And Rachel's like, too late. And then they both go, and they pray for the mom. Um, I don't know exactly what happened. But I'm believing there was something powerful that happened because they prayed for the mom, they encouraged the mom. I think she was saying things like, I'm cleaning myself up before I go to church and Miss Rachel and Emily are like, that's not, that's not the church at all. You come as you are. And so we prayed for them. Um, while they're praying, her two boys are like, I want to hold the cross. And this is how the little boy held the cross. He just hugged it. He hugged the cross. And I was like thinking about it, like how many of us are actually hugging the cross? Do we love the cross? Um, this is a picture of Emily and Rachel praying for the mom. Right after we prayed for them, we got a group picture because they wanted to take a picture. The boy in the Lakers hat, as we're starting to depart, jumped over like a chained like area that's kind of separated the sidewalk from the uh, grass. He jumps over it and falls awkwardly, and he kind of grabs up holding his back. And then like you could see like the tears starting to well up. And immediately Pastor Lenny was like, declare this over yourself. And then he told him how to pray for his own back. And instantly, he was like, hey, Pastor Lenny asked him, do you feel better? He goes, yeah. And he runs off. I thought he was running off to go play. Turns out he was running to his mom saying, all the pain is gone. All the pain is gone. And then right as we were leaving that site, an ice cream truck drives by. And then Caroline goes, this is so much fun. It's like playing hide and seek with God. I'm like, you're right. It is. Uh, th that's a picture of Pastor Lenny praying for the boy right before he got healed. This is a picture of Chloe. I think she shared this in the testimony. She was asking for um, a band-aid because she had a boo-boo. Chloe prayed for her. I was, like, really proud of Chloe. This is Chloe. I'm loving on someone else. This is the next day. Um, context matters. Monday, the youth were making fun of me all week, by the way. Um, I had a word that there was going to be someone with, like, a knee pain that needed prayer. Didn't happen Monday. The kids were, like, letting me hear it. Didn't happen Tuesday. Nothing happened. I don't think it happened Wednesday either. The kids let me hear it. And the fourth day, we're going out to do outreach. Um, and by this time, these kids and these leaders, it was hard for me to pray for people because they beat me to them. Like, before I could even get there, like, these kids were, like, running to them. Like, Ian and Danielle were fearless, like, instinct, instinctively going out up to people and, like, praying for them. Um, this was one of them. We stopped at the side of the road. Um, I was thinking about praying for her, and before I could even get there, they start praying for her. So I'm waiting on the side. Right behind me is a gas station. This is the second time this happened, by the way. Um, I'm waiting in the gas station, waiting for them to pray. And a car drives really aggressively and stops right in front of me. Second time that happened to me. The first time was in Baltimore. This is in New Haven. He stops. He rolls down the window and he goes, hey, what's going on? I'm like, oh, you know, like we're with uh, so-and-so. We, we're partnering with the church down the street. We're asking people if they need prayer. And he goes, I need prayer. I was like, I didn't even have to do anything. Like this was like the lowest hanging fruit ever. So he jumps out of the car and he's like, I need prayer. Like I'm so stressed. I have so much anxiety. Like, I have to move next week. I have, like, a bad relationship with my neighbors. Like, I'm trying to leave. Like, I have so much stress. And then he said the magic words, and my knee hurts. I was like, God's going to get you, dude. And so um, I pray for him. I ask him how much pain he feels in his knee. He said he thinks he has a torn meniscus, so he's about to go in for an MCL. I ask him how much pain he feels. He says it's an eight. So I pray for him, and I was like, how much pain is it now? Six. I said, okay, let's pray again. And I, I keep asking to pray for him. He's like, kind of like, what's going on? 
his pain went to a four, and then I prayed for him one more time, and he stopped. He was like, wait, I can move my knee. And he's like bending his knee a little bit more. He's like, but I still feel a little like uncomfortable. And so I just said in faith, I'm like, I'm praying for you that when you get to the doctors, the doctors are going to be confused because the pain is like a lot less severe than you thought it was. Um, I think as we were turning the corner, this may have been a different day. I also got the word foot pain or ankle pain, which the kids were giving it to me because I didn't see that person for like several days. Um, we're crossing an intersection, and there's a taller guy, and he's walking on a limp with his right ankle. And Pastor Lenny goes, hey, that guy's going to pray for you. <laughs> and I'm like, I think that's me. So I ask him what's going on. He said he, uh, he thinks he fractured his ankle playing basketball, like fractured, not a sprain, not a tweak. He thinks he fractured it because it hurt that bad. And he was saying he was actually on his way to the convenience store to get ice for his ankle, to ice the pain. So I was like, okay, we're going to pray for you right now. So we prayed for him. I asked him if it got better. He said yes, but he said it still hurt a little bit. So we prayed for him again. And I asked him if it felt better. And then when I asked him that the second time, he said, what did you do? He said, what did you do? You know, you did something else. I was like, no, God loves you. He's after your heart. And he's here, like he healed you. Jesus is the one that healed you. He was like, so you're telling me anytime I get injured, all I have to do is pray? <laughs> and I was like, well, kind of, you know. But, um, and then Pastor Lenny asked him the same question, do you have a church? And he goes, no. And he goes, you do now. And so we prayed for him. We blessed him. The point is this. We invited ourselves to God's party. The invitation for salvation comes from God. But I'm convinced, and I don't have the theology and, like, the perfect way to explain it, because I don't know how, but the invitation for more often comes from us. The hunger for more, we're the ones who cry out for it, and we ask God for it. And when we do, he honors that cry. He honors that cry. Um, and then something profound happened, I think, day two. When we came back to the VBS site, as soon as we parked the car and Maddie started walking to the car, the kids ran to Maddie. And as soon as they got to her, they, like, wrapped their arms around her and they, like, hugged and embraced. And God spoke to me in that moment. You guys don't know it, Trojan, but in that moment, God asked me that same question. I think I shared this several weeks ago, but John 3, 16, for God so, so, so loved the world. I think the word so is so overlooked. It's two letters, very simple, but he so loved the world that he gave his only son. Meaning, he has to love the world as much as he loves his only son for it to be worth it. When I saw Maddie and that boy embrace for that second, I felt it in my heart. Do I love these kids as much as I love my baby Ronnie? And in my own strength, absolutely not. But then I started to feel God's heart for them. And I started crying on the park by myself. No one was there. You guys didn't see it. And I really felt like I left a part of my heart there. We did a lot of walking evangelism on Harvard. I was hearing a lot of injustice that was happening. One of them being during Harvard graduation, all of the homeless people around Yale, I don't know what the government does, but they push them out. Not now, Caroline. I meant to say Yale. Thank you, Caroline. They let me hear it all the time. Um, I can't get away with anything, but when we were walking around Yale, like, during graduation, I started hearing these injustices, and it just started, like, provoking me more and more. They move the homeless people. We don't know what they do. Pastor Lenny was saying sometimes he thinks they just lock them up for the day because during the graduation, they don't want any of the homeless people around the campus because their families come. Right next to the freshman dorm is a park where we went to do outreach where all of the homeless people and drug addicts go right outside of Yale. And we went there for outreach, and one of the first people we reached out to had just shot up heroin in his bed. And we were that close, right next to Yale University. We were carrying the cross, and 
Uh, when we walked through the neighborhood that's not as eloquent or put together like Yale, people were like encouraging us. There was someone who was saying like, oh, like let me take a picture of the cross. And people were saying, what church are you a part of? And as soon as we walked through Yale, it's like vampires and garlic. We walked past the Apple store. I think everyone got a kick out of it. There were like 20 people in the Apple store as the cross was walking by. Everyone, employee, consumer, looked up like this. Like they had just seen a vampire chew garlic. <laughs> it was wild. Okay, I don't really have the theology for that. Okay, so don't, don't quote me on that. But it started provoking me a little bit more. And then I started hearing about a lot of the other injustices. We met a homeless guy who's actually famous. Uh, he was a person who fought for the welfare system, kind of was an advocate for the homeless people, and he got the boot, and he's still on the street corner. He said he uh, was a Christian and he believed it. We heard of a lot of other testimonies of, or not testimonies, but we heard stories of some of these kids, the conditions that grow, they're growing up in, not peaceful homes, a lot of homes where they don't live with their dads, they don't live with their moms, they don't live... Like, during the day in those neighborhoods, it's the grandmas who raise the kids. And I started getting provoked and provoked and provoked and provoked and provoked. And sure enough, as I'm asking some of these kids, most of these kids don't have a father. So I did some research. Some of these numbers are going to shock you. According to Google and according to a lot of other sources, a lot of those places that we visited, one and two, it's probably more if we do percentages, one and two of the students that we ministered to in New Haven do not have a dad around them. They are fatherless. They're either being raised by single moms or by their grandmothers. One and two don't have fathers. One in two of the neighborhoods that we walked across, except for Yale probably, but one in two of those students do not have fathers. Okay. Let's dig a little bit deeper. According to the Department of Justice, children from fatherless homes account for 63% of youth suicides. Ninety percent of all homeless and runaway youth. Behavioral disorders. 85% of all children without fathers exhibit behavioral disorders. 71% are high school dropouts. 70% are juveniles in in-state operated institutions. 75% of adolescent patients in substance abuse centers. 75% of these fatherless children statistically become rapists motivated by displaced anger. One in two don't have fathers in New Haven. And it's not just New Haven, it's Baltimore, it's College Park, it's Washington, D.C., it's in Maryland, it doesn't have to be in New Haven. There's a fatherless generation. And the Lord really cut me deep this trip. And I know one of the things that I loved about Hope Church when I first came was that Patrick could preach this message often and frequently, that we are called to be fathers to the fatherless. My plea to Hope Church, because I have the microphone right now, I can take it, but my plea to Hope Church is let's be that again. Let's be fathers to the fatherless. One of the people, uh, we made a lot of stops to like grocery stores, which we kind of regretted because it took so long to get out of there. But we stopped at a Walmart because um, when we were playing kickball, some of these kids are ruthless, man. They like kill the ball. One of the kids actually kicked it and it hit a tree branch so hard that the ball popped like instantly. And so we had to make an emergency run to Walmart to buy another ball. And as we were waiting, because it took so long to get out of Walmart when everyone went in, um, I saw a guy on the corner begging. And he wasn't uh, colored, he was white. 
And so we had a lot of goodie bags and we had a sandwich here. So I took a goodie bag and a sandwich and I walked over to him and I just asked him a story and I was like, hey, how long have you been out here? And he goes, almost 20 years. And I was like, okay, well, how old are you? He's like, I'm 40 now. And I asked him when he left his house and he said he was 16 when he left his house. So I asked him the question, what made you leave the house? He said he would rather get beat up outside of his house than inside of his house. So for him, the decision was easy. And he's been in the streets ever since then. And I'm trying to make this a heavy message. Pastor Chi said, preach what's on my heart. So I'm doing that. It's time for us as Hope Church to be fathers again. To be fathers to the fatherless, mothers to the motherless. It's time for us as Hope Church to reclaim that. To go after them. Because the statistics say a lot about these people. And the last night of the mission trip, we prayed, and Pastor Lenny and Pastor Brittany thanked us. And Pastor Brittany, so Pastor Brittany was praying that the laborers would come to help them, which we did, and so I was super grateful for that. But Pastor Lenny said something that I haven't been able to forget. He said, in New Haven, the people that we reach, most of that city doesn't even know that they exist. They're just a number to them. And he said, we came to be with them. It's the ministry of presence. I'm going to have the worship team come up. Um, yeah, I apologize. So, Dan, just a couple things. There is an invitation for more of God. The invitation comes from us. And I know a lot of the... Um, they, there was like a house church training for a lot of the shepherds. They went, and it was a rich time. But the engine that drives everything, the engine that drives our worship, the engine that drives everything is the fact that we are children of God, sons and daughters of God. So My prayer is that the spirit of adoption will come upon us, the spirit of adoption in Galatians 4, 6, by which we cry out, Abba, Father, that we will carry the heart of adoption for people who don't have fathers and mothers. So I'm going to pray, uh, we'll do a worship song, and then we'll break into communion. Father, I just thank you for what you're doing all around the world. You are a good father. You are a father to the fatherless. You are faithful even when we are faithless, God. We have seen that time and time again. You are faithful even when we don't have enough faith. So, Father, even as we worship you and break bread and go into our meetings afterwards, God, I'm asking you today, Lord, would you give us your heart? Would you give us your heart for your people? Would you give us your heart for the unseen ones, the voice, to be the voice for the voiceless, God, that we will be the father to the fatherless, Lord, that we will be the defender of those who don't have anyone to defend them. God, and will we do it in your power, not by zeal, not by our own strength, but by the spirit of the living God. So we ask you, Holy Spirit, would you come? Would you move in our hearts and move in our lives? In Jesus' name we pray. Yeah. 
searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers only you provide, cause you know just You're good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. We're loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. You're good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who I am, it's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. ways. To us, you are perfect. First Sunday of each month, we celebrate, we remember, uh, celebrate one of our sacraments, which is communion. This week, I celebrated my wife and I, our 38th anniversary. We celebrate. But the thing is that, I, I, I was to, point, point is not that. I, I grew up in a church that celebrated communion every time they worshiped, because for them, if you didn't do communion on Sunday, that was really a worship. I think that's true. But we do it once a month, we, and we don't want to become habit, but we or habitual, but we want to celebrate what Christ has done. Today, I, I really believe God is really saying, the psalm for the today really was, our God is father to the fatherless, defender of the widows in his holy habitation, he places lowly into family houses. He lead our prisoners into pr prosperity. That's who our God is. Today we celebrate our, and, and the love of our Lord Jesus Christ manifest on the cross. Especially he came to seek and save the lost. We are here because he found us. We are here because he saved us. We are here because our Lord, our God, found us lost, broken, and saved us, gave us life. The night before Jesus went to the cross, he said he was celebrating Passover with us, his disciples, on the night, that night. And, uh, and he said, while they're celebrating, they're remembering the Passover, he took the bread. Gave it to them. This is my body broken for you. The word of God says, in the same way that night, Jesus took the cup. Gave it to them, gave it to the disciples. Take and drink. This is my body shed for you as a blood of the covenant. He made a new covenant with us, his own blood. He said, as often as you do it, you do remembrance of me, Jesus said. But today we come to celebrate his love and grace for us. Not only for us, he, he so loved the world. He gave his one and only begotten son. 
He doesn't want a single one perish. He wants all of his sons and daughters to be gathered in his home, in his heart. That's when we come and remember what he has done for us. When he invite all of us to come and worship God in us and, and take the elements and, and we will celebrate together, remember what Christ has done for us. As we always say, as we always say, if we need, if all those who believe in Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior, you are welcome to come to come and partake of, of the communion. If you are, if you are, even if you are not baptized yet, if you believe in Christ as Lord and Savior, you're welcome to come and join us. We invite our little ones to come because they are brought into the covenant by infant baptism. They're brought in together. Let us pray. Father, we love you for loving us. We are yours, oh God. We come. Remember what our Lord Jesus has done for us. How you have loved us. How on the cross you manifest your love. You broke and you gave your life that we may find life, that you may rescue us, you may deliver us. By, our, by your stripes, we are healed. By your death, we are made alive. We give you glory, God. We thank you for your love and grace. We worship you, God. We give you glory. Come, we ask, even these elements in our know, remembrance should become real in our life through faith be life to us. Oh, Father, we may grow in your grace. We love you, God. We may have your heart, your ways, your, your heart, God. Your heart for the broken, your heart for the homeless, your heart for the fatherless, your heart for those that are perishing. God, we love you. We honor you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Is there anyone who has not gotten the elements? Let us pray and before we take them, we receive it together. Father, we love you. We thank you for the grace. We thank you for your love manifest on the cross. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your sacrifice, your love. We remember your goodness and faithfulness. We worship you. We see your goodness, your love for us. We honor you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's sing the final chorus together. Father, we declare that you are the father to the fatherless. God, that you are the hope in the darkest areas and darkest corners of this world. And we declare, God, that you are the one who is faithful to do all the only things that you can do. So we honor you, God. We say you are a good father. You have been so, so good to us. You have been so, so good to us. And we put our trust and our hope in you. Now may the Lord bless you, may he keep you, may his face shine on you, may you see him, may you see his smile in every twist and turn this week. We honor you, God. We say you are good. In Jesus' name. All right, as we announced, we will go straight into our congregational meeting. So we thank you for those who are staying with us. You do not necessarily have to be an official member, a covenant.